Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be flexion, distraction, injuries to the spine as requested by Dr. Astorian. So, this is a 29-year-old man who uh, presented to the emergency room with back pain. And he was climbing a climbing wall, which... Um, actually, Paul, do you want to say the presentation since you know the patient better? Basically, uh, it was a... 29-year-old person uh, on a rock climbing wall and did not have a harness on and fell onto uh, his buttocks. Ten feet. About ten feet. Probably. Yeah, okay. And um, was presented to the uh, emergency room. So I wanted to make a point with everyone that this is just my opinion, but anybody who comes to the emergency room with a spine injury and any kind of deficit, I think should go to the Internet print out the Asia classification spinal cord injury sheet. This is the sheet that uh, you can get on Google and fill it out. So do you all agree with that? Yeah. Forces you to examine the patient, forces you to document everything and be thorough. Otherwise, you don't do a good job. But um, this patient did not have a deficit, but I just wanted to throw this out there for everyone that it's readily available. Just print it out in the emergency room and fill it out. Uh, and just uh, for motor exam, because motor exam is key, this is just a review. Zero is nothing. One contracts. Two cannot overcome gravity. Three overcomes gravity, full range of motion. Four has resistance. Five is strong. So the first thing that patients get, I think, when they go to the emergency room is a CAT scan. Is that right? One second, please, sir. Thank you. Before, can you go back one slide? One thing that's important to notice is that there's no pluses and minuses in the spine. So range of motion is from 15 to, uh, no, from 45 to 90. Okay, so it's going to be full range of motion. So the, the, the risk is if Brian says it's a 2 or, or you said it's a 3 and then someone comes in the next day and says, no, this is a 2, it might be interpreted as a deficit or as a change, as a delta. And we've got to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. So with uh, 3 or higher, it's got to be through full range of motion and gravity eliminated. So let's say I'm doing this, checking biceps. What is this? So I can do. So we got two. Gravity eliminated. This is a one, okay, because it's got to go through a full range of motion for it to be a two. So a toggle, gravity eliminated is a one. Yeah, in my note in the office, I say by by definition, this is a one out of five. Although the patient does have strength, you know, it's hard sometimes because people may have any another injury, you know. Okay, so this uh, physical exam, I believe, was um, intact, neurologically intact, motor sensory. So um, this is the initial CAT scan, and uh, Paul, who should uh, discuss the CAT scan? Uh, how about Tamir? So, <laughs> so we have a coronal CT scan of the black lumbar spine, and this young patient has normal bone mineralization. Um, that's a you know history, age of the patient, status of the bone mineralization is important. And uh, down from the bottom, five, four, three, two, one. There appears to be a fracture involved in the T12 vertebral body, and on the coron the, the left word coronal. Uh, Slice, you get a trabecular compacted fracture line near the superior end plate. As you move to the center, you're moving more posteriorly with the patient. You're getting to see the posterior elements in the facet joints. As you get, uh, I don't see much pathology in the middle uh, coronal uh, section. On the right uh, coronal section, there's an arrow pointed. 
I'll be honest, I forgot why I put the arrow. Probably the dense part level. Probably just the dense part level. Okay. Yeah. Well, we are at the level of the facet joint there. So, you know, I would be concerned maybe there. It's hard to tell, like, to be honest with you, what's going on in that. But you want to be able to see the posterior elements and to see if there's any um, uh, distraction of the facets. Uh, I, have more, I have more images. Okay. So... So as of right now, I mean, there's a there's an acute injury. Okay. Uh, at T12. At T12. Sagittal cuts. So on sagittal cuts, uh, again, from going from left to right. How about Megan? We want to make a one to over. Um, so we have the sagittal images. We still see that um, compression fracture. We see a little bit of distraction of that, uh, the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. We don't see much repulsion. So no, uh, no retropulsion right here. Do you think that the, the spinous processes are more splayed at the injury oh. level compared to the non-injured level? Yeah, there's an increase um, in the space between the uh, interspinous processes. So it's more than just their flexing. Correct. Right. Okay. What would the mechanism of injury be here? So that's your just uh, uh, flexion distraction injury. Right, it's pulled apart. Brian, what's a knapsack sign? Hmm? What's a knapsack sign? Uh, I'm not sure. Megan, you know what a knapsack sign is? No, I don't know. Roshan? Two. What's like the uh, Tyler? What's a knapsack sign? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like the thing you carry over your shoulder. Which is what it's supposed to look like, but it's like the vertebral body, posterior aspect of it. Where, where would you see that? These guys don't even know what a knapsack is. So. Yeah. They, they, still, they still use the knapsack in millennium, don't they? They still use knapsack. I don't know. Mo, what's a knapsack? What is a knapsack? Is that a backpack? <laughs> it's like a small backpack. That's like from like the twenties, <laughs> isn't it? Like the hobos, the hobos had knapsacks. This is described this is described as twenty twenty years ago. So okay. you carry your lunch huh? so You carry your lunch in. Okay, so was the thing, you can't really blow up that. So 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 well, you're kind of on it. Where do you see? What is it supposed to describe? Um, I'm not sure. I just I know you brought this up before. You don't remember. Thank you. Uh, when you have a fracture, when you have when you have a burst fracture, you will often see a retropulsion of the either the posterior superior part of the body or inferior. More often, the posterior superior that fractures right through the basic vertebral vein. And I, I think it even looks like at that level there is probably a little bit of a burst where you see that little knuckle of bone that's retropulsed. That's called a knapsack sign. So I would look at that and I'd say maybe there's a little burst component to that. It, look, it looks a little different than the vertebral body above and below. So I'd wonder whether there is a little bit of a fracture of the middle column. Okay, but that's a knapsack sign. All right, it looks like a little knapsack. Okay, that's what I got a little person back. So the, so cor the cortex posteriorly between the pedicles. It's the it's between right the superior plate and the base of the vertebral vein, that posterior cortex. That's right between the pedicles. And it gives you that little bit of a. But the pedicles you know, break in that piece in the middle. Correct. Back. Right, right. Okay. So, um, who wants to keep this? There's a little fleck of bone off the facet. Uh, I'm not sure the significance of this. And this is at the injury. This is a, the actual cut at the level of the injury. So, does anyone, you, Brian? There. what's important about this injury, this uh, cut? So this is where the knapsack sign comes from, I guess. Yeah. Depends on the level of the cut, number two. That could be the inferior part of the body, but but that's where it should be correct. So that looks normal. You don't see the superior superior part of the body. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You don't see. So what is it called? What's that sign called? Uh, uh, like an empty facet sign. Correct. Empty facet. That's right. You don't see. You're seeing only part of the super articulating process or super articulating surface, right? You're not seeing the inferior articulating part of the facet, so it's an empty facet sign. What does it indicate? To be, to like, uh, 
So this is the level of the pedicles. All right, does everybody get an MRI if they're neurologically intact? I'm just curious. Well, I think for this kind of injury, it, you want to. Right, why would you get, what's an MRI help you with? Right, do you see a ligamentous disruption on this on the MRI? Okay, we'll point it out this point here. Yeah. So this thing is disrupted and maybe here, a little white. There should be, the ligament inflavum, I, I look at it posteriorly, it's black. So, so this is a black line, which is the ligament inflavum. And, and you can see if someone's stenotic uh, for arthritis because it's big. And you can see here black line. Can you guys see? Yeah, black line, black line, black line, and then it's gone. And then just white. So um, I assume that's blood. What do you think, Samir? I agree. Uh, so yeah, so you're getting the disruption uh, at the level of the ligament inflavum. Interspinous ligaments uh, on the middle column you can see the best. And then for more superficial level, supraspinatus or supraspinous ligaments, yeah. you have a full collection of the bright signal from above mm -hmm. all the way down. So that could be hematoma. I, yeah, actually, this is a good example. Look at the black line here, the supraspinous ligament, and then here's the ligament where the ligament inflavum would be. And intraoperatively, this is not a very stout ligament, but it's it's ruptured all the way through. So what's the significance of that? Like, what's PLC? What's the significance of that brightness? Does it mean nothing? It's a waste of time. Things being disrupted. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very important. And here's just another view. I'm not sure if this um and and how about the canal and the spinal cord, which is pretty important. What what other things could could be in the spinal canal and spinal cord with some injuries? Can anybody tell say? Megan, since you're next to me, I'm looking at you. What could, what could be in the spinal canal that's not? Um, I mean, you could get... With fractures. Bone, bone, bone. bone. What else? Hematoma. And Big hematoma, hematoma compresses spinal cord. Yeah. What else could the spinal cord... Does, does the spinal cord always look perfect? It looks absolutely perfect. Spinal cord could have... If it's injured, it could look like... It could just have increased signal intensity. Yeah. Like could be... Injured. Yeah, it could be bright, suggestive of a spinal cord injury, which is important to know. Mm -hmm. So none of those things are present. So these are the axial cuts uh, from from the same level. And um, I don't think it really shows anything unless maybe Samir, because he's the expert, he can see something that can teach us. Well, uh, it does not show any traumatic injury or core contusion. You can see the, the cord has no signal. You probably can't see the ventral and dorsal roots as well. See, like right um, there, these guys? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You can see it here, too. Look at this. It's a nice example. It's a good MRI. And uh, this is probably down to L1 level. You can only see the kidneys. But I, I don't see any, uh, I mean, the patient is lucky with no forward injury. It's a kidney right here, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, what type of fracture is this? Who can tell me? Chance fracture, right? Which was uh, which was described in 1948 by a radiologist. Uh, I think it was in Manchester, Manchester or London or something. And uh, he, he was a radiologist. And I sent everybody the article. Everybody read it. It was like just two pages. And the treatment was just everybody does well. Um, and the the it's a jackknife. This is the original description. It's a compression anteriorly and distraction posteriorly through the bony elements. That's that was the original dis, um, uh, description, and it's a jackknife. I put a jackknife in there. Maybe people don't know what it is. Injury, where or lap belt. Many people call it lap belt. Where the most and people you can interrupt me if you think I'm wrong, but it's usually in children. The, these lap belt injuries that just have uh, that. You can just see where the axis of motion is at the big dot, 
and due to the lap belt and the anterior portion of the column compresses and the posterior portion distracts. And what other injuries do these children usually have? Yeah, so like duodenum, tear, and, and usually they present with abdominal trauma and, and the spine fracture goes undiagnosed. And, and uh, I've seen that happen in a baby once it was like, um, when I was in my spine fellow, it was an um, 18-month-old who had a duodenal tear from a car accident. She had a lap, baby had a lap belt and uh, no one diagnosed the spine fracture until like six months later. And at that point, the child had a kyphotic deformity. And it also happened to child abuse. Child abuse if it's not a, uh, if it's not a car accident. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other interesting point is if the axis of rotation is anterior to the spine, the whole thing can just distract. Like you can imagine if you took this, if you took this black circle and just brought it forward for whatever reason, like the mechanism of injury, the whole the whole spine just distracts and there's no compression anteriorly. So I just want to go over seat belts. This is my dad's first car that he ever bought uh, with cash. It's a it's a Valiant. And I know Paul likes cars, so I go over a Valiance. And this is the back seat of the car. I've never seen this Valiance. Huh? You never, <laughs> never sat in a Valiance? <laughs> and this is the back seat of the car. And I can remember when I saw this. When I saw this photo, I, I could imagine my mother's uh, voice: "Shut up and get in the back of the car now!" And we would be back there just fighting the whole time. You can see there's no seatbelt. And the National Traffic Motor Vehicle Safety Act 1966 required seatbelts, but people still didn't use them. We never used seatbelts. They're like, we just threw them out. Um, and then I think 1979, was Tennessee was the first state to mandate child restraint in cars. Uh, and it, this, that's a typo, but it wasn't until 1984, New York was the first state to mandate seatbelts. Um, and nobody used to use seatbelts, really. And uh, the lap belt is what usually causes uh, this lap belt type injury. And now children have to be in you know, car seats, um, facing backwards, I think, until two, and then forwards until, I don't know the exact rules, like 10 or something, or 10, and then booster seats. And the three-point belt it gives you a lot of safety. And you can imagine this dummy, how this, this injury could occur from the uh, lap belt. Uh, how you compress in the front and distract in the back. So I, I put this slide because this is how I imagined this person fell, right on the backside, and you can see how this would cause the same type of injury, uh, like a flexion distraction. So the other uh, key aspects is: is it directly through the bone, or is it through the ligament? So on the left is just a one-level osseous. Uh, middle is two-level osseous, and then on the right is purely ligamentous. And I think the purely ligamentous is more unstable than the osseous. The osseous can heal, but the ligamentous can never heal. Does anybody have any comments on that? Osseous versus ligamentous. Absolutely. That is the more interesting question. Is going to change the fracture versus going to change the fracture versus showing the posterior ligamentous destruction? So what is Why is that? Why is it not up? It can just, it's a simple answer. And the bone can heal. The, the bones can heal just like any bone. And who can tell me what the thoracolumbar injury classification system is? No one? So it's just a system in 2005 uh, from Vaccaro to describe spine fractures and whether they need surgery. And do you guys use it? What do you think? Uh, Messran or Paul or Justin? I think it's the best out there. I, mean, I think it's the one we use. Neurologic status and integrity of the... For clinical or for research? Well, it's the only one that includes MRI scan. And I feel like, you know, these days, MRI is sort of the study of choice. So if you have a system that doesn't incorporate MRI scan, it doesn't incorporate neurologic status. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, you know, basic decision-making on incomplete best evidence. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and, and I think I think it's helpful because th this uh, it gives you an idea of the um, sorry level of injury of the fracture. So if it's a if it's a high level injury, you you need to stabilize the uh, injury. So and, and you know it's high level injury because if anteriorly you have a fracture, posteriorly the ligaments uh, stretched or disrupted, and the patient's neurologically intact. What I do in my mind is I think about the time of the injury what happened to the spine and how loose that thing is. And when you open it up, how loose is it going to look like? So I think it's a lot more likely to be very unstable injury is if the neurological elements have been injured, if posteriorly everything stretched or gone, and anteriorly you have a fracture. So that's that's what I think. I think that's why I think it's a good... Um, So I just wanted to review, because we're talking about children and spine, it's not really a child fracture, but it's commonly found in children. I think we should review uh, how a child's spine grows. And they grow through the physis here, and the child's spine has an apophysis right here, an apophyseal ossification. And you really can't see it on the x-ray. It's very difficult to get an idea of this. You have to, you have to get pathology to look at it. And at age six is when you start to see some bone and at 13 it's mostly healed and at 18 it should be complete the fusion is complete and the reason why this is important is because you can fracture through the physis and you can see this in adults all the time uh, an old apophyseal injury that and most of the most of the, like the men they had no idea they have it and they're like ah, what I, don't, I never had an injury when i was a kid so uh, and i see it all the time Do you guys agree with that probably playing football or who knows what what is that? So what, uh, no, what is that called on the right? You see it all. You're describing that. What's that term for that appearance on the right? Radiographically seen an adult. This thing. Something vertebra. Anybody? Any thoughts? Anybody's done spine twice and about to graduate? Called, it's called the limbus vertebra, okay? That's a term for it. When you see an old apophysteal ring that's unfused or, you know, a limbus vertebra, that's the term radiographically. So I just want to review more fractures uh, very briefly. An uh, anterior compression fracture is a low energy injury, most common, um, and the medial, middle column's intact. Just anteriorly, there's a fracture. Now, Denis three column uh, model, uh, three columns of the anterior column is from the anterior longitudinal ligament to the mid two thirds. Middle column goes to the posterior longitudinal ligament, and posterior is everything behind that. Please, yeah, please. So, Especially for kyphoplasty, that is definitely the, the wrong answer now. Uh, the academy has a strong recommendation against kyphoplasty for the treatment of ACL compression factors. That's like a Supreme Court, you know, uh, statement that is not likely to be reversed. So if you see kyphoplasty on on the answer uh, on the entry uh, exams, say yes, that's not the wrong answer. It's like some DMV. What's the wrong answer? I don't, I don't, let's say it one more time. I don't understand what you said. Plastic for the treatment of compression fractures. There's the academy. The Orthopedic Academy has a strong recommendation against all kyphoplasties for all fractures. For the treatment of senile compression fractures. Hmm. Why is that? I didn't know that. Prospective randomized studies can tend to show that it's in a better position. Other than the issue of pain relief, I think it's shown. And virtual plastic, the jury's still out, uh, but hypoplastic is a strong recommendation against. Mm -hmm. 
Huh. So for things like the in-training of the boards, they're going to want to throw that out because that's something we have to throw out. Um, and just uh, just major uh, minor injuries are transverse process, particular process, pars, fractures, spinous process. And CPL injuries can be either one level, uh, bony or ligamentous, or two level. Burst fractures can involve just one end plate, two end plates, can be kyphotic, can have rotation. Burst, frac uh, burst fractures can be flexion, rotation, flexion, distraction. Shear injuries in either direction. So some burst fractures have a knapsack sign right here. <laughs> and uh, this this piece corresponds to this piece right there. And um, this piece also is connected to the ligament, to the disc and the ligament. So if you just if you go through the front of someone's um, abdomen. And put a distraction across both and take both discs out and distract that space with a distractor. Synthes has a beautiful distractor. That piece you can then that piece comes out of the spinal canal. We looked at lines through spines process um, that he, the arrow shows. Uh, what, what does that have a high likelihood to be associated with intraoperatively if you were going posteriorly on these patients? Megan, what do you think? The laminar fracture right here. I'm not sure what you're getting at other than, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Anybody? What do you think he caught in there? Well, we're going to play typically on either side of that. Typically, dural injuries, okay? Not uncommon is with those wishbone kind of injuries that you catch the dural and you get dural tears. So, when you go in there, you find that dural tear associated with that. When I was at Shock Trauma once, we had a uh, Jehovah's Witness who had a terrible fracture, refused surgery. Crit was like 15. So, it was like we just put him in a brace. I took him back two months later. He's severely stenotic. And as I was removing the lamina, what had happened is the, the lamina fracture had opened during the injury. Dural tear, the nerve roots went into the lamina, closed down. The nerve roots were inside of the lamina. So as I removed the lamina, I pulled up a nerve root because it was inside of, of the lamina. So you can just imagine like that, what happened in the injury and what you just described. Um, and then fracture dislocations are the, the, the uh, highest um, energy injury. And just, I remember, I remember when I was a fellow in Chicago, we had many children that were paralyzed from spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality. And I think that's dramatically decreased, I'm pretty sure, because of seatbelts. And just the main reason is the spinal column is more elastic than the spinal cord. So the spinal column stretches and distracts and deforms, and the spinal cord gets injured. Um... And I think it's usually yeah, under the, under the age of eight, the children are very uh, pliable. So h how do we how do we treat our fracture? Back to our fracture. So we have a flexion distraction injury, lap belt injury, and a relatively young person, not low energy, kind of ten feet. I think is a pretty high energy. So who wants who? Paul, who do you want to ask? Who wants to do treatment? Treatment options. So Roshan, what do you think? Yeah, so I was outside. Can you just go? And 29-year-old uh, flexor distraction injury, seatbelt from a fall from 10 feet, neurologically intact. Posterior lig ligaments out, anterior columns fractured. So if you have a three-year-old injury and it's not a bone, you can change that to stabilize and stabilize that as well as the five, as well as the four-year-old. So you go two levels above and below for this posterior. With laminectomy, was that laminectomy? Well, I would like to see, I, mean, I don't see any retropulse fragments. I would like to see an MRI to see if we could do laminectomy. So we, saw, we showed the MRI, the MRI you showed earlier in this patient. There's no retropulse fragment. Fragments? There was yeah. no retropulse fragment. It was normal. Uh, it was normal. Okay. Here's the MRI. It just showed the spinous process of the uh, ligamentous injury posteriorly. Here's the MRI. I don't think you need to. Okay. 
All right. So, what do you do? What would you do, Tyler? I think traditionally, it's two above and two below, but I think you can just do one above and one below. Okay. What, what are, are all the options for treatment, though? What are all the options? So, I think, uh, first of all, the approach. So, I think the posterior approach, because we have to reconstitute the posterior tension band. Uh, with the posterior approach, I think we can either choose a short segment uh, stabilization or a long segment stabilization. I think a long segment stabilization is going to be the best. Right. So that's to, we're not asking for your judgment at all. I'm just asking all the different options for treatment. So you yeah, have posterior, short or long. There's two options. What other options are there? How about a cast? Is that a good option? Or a brace? What other options? Megan, what other options are there? Good or, good or bad? Is a cast or a brace good? Non-op non is always good. Non-operative. Yeah, that should always be at the top of anybody's list. No matter what we do. So how about a cast or brace? Would that be good? I'd say no because you have ligaments injury that posteriorly that may not heal in the appropriate position in your body. How about anterior? Can we do a corpectomy? So we can do a corpectomy, but then uh, there is a PLC injury, so just doing a corpectomy uh, will not be sufficient, and then we have to uh, do an add-on posture stabilization to... Uh, you can do a front back. A front back. Oh. Um, okay, so we've got options. We've got non-operative, you got an anterior, you got an anterior posterior, and you got two different posterior options. Okay, so whenever, if you're taking the boards, it doesn't matter if it's spine or anything else. When you're doing your oral boards and someone says, what are the options for treatment? List all the options. Don't give your judgment unless you want to fail. Okay, just give the options. All of them, whatever's in your head. Okay, it's that's a, it. It's, Don't good. More it, than that. it's a good exercise because it forces you to think about all the options always. Because you forget and you get like really narrow-minded. I think that's the point, right? That's exactly. So why do you care about the posterior ligamentous complex, Megan and, and Mohit? You referenced that. So if you did a corpectomy here and you got the vertebra above the injured level or the vertebra below the injured level diffused, what do you care about the posterior elements then? So that's like a tension band, which is a very important stabilizer for the uh, for the spine, and does that. Okay, the tension band though spans the level that you just fused. So what does it doesn't matter once it's fused? Is my point. We got Brian here. He's a, a guy who's got some experience with spine biomechanics. If you fuse the level, a le the level where the injury was, does the does this tension band matter anymore following the fusion? No, in this case, the anterior body is just a back to me. Once it's fused, is Once the key, it's fused, is the key it's word. Okay, so let's say you take your approach, Megan, you mentioned that the posterior ligaments are disrupted, not operative treatment. What does that matter? Um, I think the ligaments don't heal as well or as quickly as the bones do. So you're, that whole time of non-operative treatment, while we're hoping that they'll heal, you'll have um, instability and uh, risk for worsening of his injury that could lead to spinal cord compression. Um, so how would it worsen? How would the injury worsen? What's the likelihood that you think that this guy progresses to a neurologic injury? I'm not sure. But just look at it. Is there a combination of the bone? Does yeah. it look like it's fragmented? Do you think that the, this is a you know 30 year old, 27 year old guy? Is his bone health good or bad? Right? There's things that you look at to determine the likelihood of the, the soft tissue injury progressing over time. I mean, his bone quality on this looks okay. It's a little bit of combination and inter aspect. Um, What's the natural history for someone who has a ligamentous injury? Like, what is it specifically? You think it's neurologic injury? There's something else that you're more worried about over time, not treating a ligamentous injury. What do you think, Brian? Uh, so I think he's unstable, so you're going to have a progression of the I mean, he's a perceptual chiropractor. So it's a uh, huge risk. Right uh, uh, so I think it's easy to get a high risk for a progression. Maybe 
job because it's not, like, not going to proceed that fragmentation to get very, very quickly. The root where you join the stable uh, is uh, cathodic. Mm -hmm. So you think that he's going to progress into greater kyphosis? What, what about what about the three S's? Where we, we haven't talked about that in a while. What are the three S's we think about? For uh, sagittal balance. Right. Stenosis. Right. Spondylolisthesis. No. Oh, no. Spelling. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Sagittal. You got the first two. What's the third one? Stability. Stability. Right. Three things to think about with mm -hmm. spinal problems. She has. It's actually a female, not a male. She has two of the three. Right. Instability and sagittal deformity, mm -hmm. and over time, you know, the, the, this person, if you're treating them monocularly, may get a little more kyphotic at that fractured segment, plus may develop degeneration of that disc, which will collapse and may get even more sagittal deformity. What are the three S's? I like that. Say it one more time. Stenosis, stenosis, stability, stability sagittal deformity. Sagittal deformity. Things we should think about every time we. Stenosis, things. stability, and sagittal deformity. Okay, so Brian, is there a way to reduce the set joints by that or whatever? Um, How does this look above and below? Does it look good? Does this look above and below? Yeah, it said it just looked pristine, all in place. Uh, and you could, you could, I, you could try to think. Do you think his body habitus would be suitable for bracing? Uh, she actually looks pretty skinny. So I think relatively, relatively speaking, good. a lot of our patients probably, probably so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so amenable to bracing, thin body habitus, male, no chest in the way of the brace. Pop. That's mm -hmm. it. Male. How about, when you were at shock trauma, how many extension casts? We did two. We did two. Yeah, we did one. The, the guy we talked about was the uh, Jehovah's Witness, and um, it worked. How many years ago? This was in 1998. Yeah. Okay. So how much? We put it. Do you guys have you guys ever done it? You did it in peds yeah, a lot. Yeah. In peds. Yeah. You guys rotated on shock trauma seen any extension braces? No. You put the patient. You know, it's interesting though because you can do it. There's been a. Yeah, towards surgical, yeah, and surgical fixation. Attention. You put them between two tables, and then the patient lays yeah. in between. It takes like 20 people. It works, but uncomfortable for the patient. Okay, any other comments? You keep going? Okay, so let's uh, let's go. So with the posterior, for, for those of you guys that said uh, posterior, um, you, you put in the screws, whether it's Short segment or long segment, and then what do you do? You put in the rod, lock everything in place, close up. I think it depends on the words the type of fracture. The this, fracture. This, 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 this patient here. I think we'll uh, do a compress, compression yeah, compress. More on the, on the rods. To so it's a compression uh, posterior contract. Right. So recreate the posterior tension, man. And all right, well, I don't know, what is this thing? Uh, well, this, this, this is the robotic navigation, actually, which was used on this patient to place kind of screws. And um, do you want to keep going, Paul, or whoever was in the case? Yeah, it was Brad, myself, and basically um, we put the patient on the table. As soon as you made the incision, there was blood and there was wide open disruption of the ligamentous structures posteriorly, so that was all removed. No lamina yeah. fracture, right? There was no laminar fracture, it was mm -hmm. purely ligamentous. Mm -hmm. So we did do not a laminectomy, but we removed the ligamentum flay, all that disrupted flavin, so that when we would, you know, close this, we would make sure there'd be no buckling on the on the cord. Uh, and we had the patient on an Axis Jackson table, so we could, after placing the screws robotically, we were able to just extend the table, and that kind of closed it down. And um, I'm not sure which. These are all the images in drop. All those dots are, there's actually go back to the spinous process clamp that's your marker for the robotic navigation. Those little dots are the robotic, you know, for us to get our um, interoperative images and then to then marry them up with the CT scan that we had pre op. Can you use the robot uh, uh, landmarks to have the line up for interrupted guys? Like from the head of the movie, the Marcus series of points. 
Well, the, see those little, those little, you, you basically, those dots are on the fluoroscope. Well, then there's software that if you have a preoperative CT scan and you get those fluoroscopic images, it automatically marries up the, it verifies that you, you have a proper alignment, anatomic alignment. So we don't do anything to the vertebrae themselves other than put a marker so that if you move the vertebrae, it tells, you know, the, the robot that you've you've changed the alignment of the of the anatomy after you've got your fluoroscopic images. Here's the post on. Right. So that we put within oh, one this above, intro, one intro, I'm sorry, interrupt. Interrupt. Yeah, interrupt one above, one below. I think we have uh, maybe a unilateral screw on one side. I can't tell. You have the AP? No, we use so we're able to put screws uh, into the injured vertebrae, one above, one below. We did actually just saw this patient yesterday. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the post-op standing view. Right. I think we're able to, if anything, maybe a little reduction, I think, of the compression fracture. I think maybe it's, it's come back. We definitely were able to, I think, compress the posterior elements. You can see that they're all symmetrical, I believe, now. And um, uh, this patient is doing well. And you no used pain. a Trinity bone graft. Do you want to com any comment on that? Yeah, this is, you know, in order to get to the fuse, we wanted, we used a, a bone graft that has mesenchymal cells in it. Um, so it has all the three components of bone grafting, you know, conduction, uh, um, induction, and progenitor cells, basically. So we use this Trinity. This is one of the types of bone graft. There are other types that have similar products. There's a new product out now that's unique to um, bone osteogenic cells that we're going to use today. And um, since we didn't take any bone in, off of anything, we didn't have any bone graft, so we thought that would be a, a better option versus going to the iliac crest, potentially grabbing, you know, creating morbidity there. So that was just packed along the poster elements. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The same, identical. No change at all in line with, uh, and uh, like I said, the patient feels great, you know, and starting an exercise program. Great. Yeah, so this is one of those cases where the, I think the injury classification system um, that Carol really applies. I don't know if you guys have looked that up or scored this, but um, he gets four points for the distraction, and he gets three for the mechanisms of injury, which gives it a seven, no neurologic injury. Um, a five or greater generally indicates surgery. A three or less is no surgery, and a four is in between. Um, if you didn't have the MRI scan, he'd probably be a three because the MRI shows that ligament tear. Uh, puts him in the operative category. Um, I think it still sits a little bit on the borderline, this particular case. If, as I look at it, you know, if you think about what you would want, um, if you are thin, you can tolerate wearing a brace. Um, it does avoid the need for surgery, general anesthetic, the risk for infection, implants in your body. I think you could get a nice reduction with a hyperextension brace. Uh, and I think the, the virtual body issue would heal. And you have to follow that person. You have to buy into follow-up. You know, it's almost like a physical radius fracture where you're following to see if it moves. You know, see if it's two weeks, see if it's four weeks, see if it's six weeks, if they're not moving, and you probably keep them in a cast or brace for three months. Has there been yep. any studies that show the failure rate of non operative treatment in these patients? Where uh, for distraction injuries, not so much, but for neurologically intact burst fractures, yeah. there's a really nice prospective randomized trial looking at the JVJS published now over 10 years ago, which strongly favors non operative treatment, including deformity of progression. There's no difference in the operative versus non operative. Uh, so that's in a neurologically intact individual without. A lot of attention being paid to the, the integrity of the So just as an, as an aside, we did send these images to our colleagues at the University of Maryland in shock trauma, oh. and, and they recommended uh, non opera treatment, which, oh, wow. which was surprising to us. And uh, after talking to the patient yesterday, this, you know, this individual wants to go back to rock climbing, and, yeah. and I think we did the right thing, but yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it was... Uh, if you did recommend on-op, would you definitely give them that conversation with Lido? They may have that 
I think you got to talk to you got to talk to people like yeah. this. Yeah. This, this is that. Yeah. Explain yeah. it. I mean, there's going to be you know, as you get you know, life is a kyphosing event, and over time, yeah. as, as you get more kyphotic at other levels, this certainly adds to spinal deformity. If they're going to have a early spinal deformity yeah. at 29 years of age. Just from just I don't know, but from what you guys seem to talk about, it sounds like the spinal deformity is like such a larger surgery and morbid surgery than, than this. So you I feel like know, it's also but, your... But I, yeah, I think in this, it's a great question, Megan. In this case, you're going to know if he loses alignment way before he's sort of stuck in a, some sort of oh. deformed state. You would know it's sort of three months. So I think you're going to intervene. Your non-operative approach would be relatively short-lived, just like a distal radius. Yeah. You know, if it's falling apart, you're going to intervene. So I think that's the only thing I would have you know, probably counseled the patient. Look, you can do non-operative. We'll know. Problem is, you've burned two to three months of your life waiting to see if this works. The benefit is you can avoid an operation. And you gotta also put yourself in the shoes. Like if this is me, you know, you gotta consider your work status. You know, it's gonna be hard to work as a surgeon with a brace, walk into someone's room with a huge cast on and say, I'm gonna get one scrub my hair to raise the case, you know. Um, whereas it's you know, probably four weeks out from this, you could be back operating. So there's those factors that you have to weigh in the decision. It is it's one other factor that, that we talk about when it comes to the fracture conference. Mm -hmm. You know, as a surgeon, you have a tendency to, to kind of watch things and they get a little worse and you kind of kind of convince yourself that maybe it's gonna be okay, yeah. it's gonna be okay, <laughs> and then and then you know, at six months you look back and you say, Maybe it's not so okay. So so I think the tendency is once you've made that commitment to the patient, their mind says, I don't need surgery. It's kind of hard to reverse that train of thought and uh, that paradigm. So so it's, it sounds good to watch them, but, but you, you wind up accepting more than you would have normally when you take that once route, I think. I think if you watch them, you set, you set a goal. You say, look, if it gets to this we're doing surgery. But then you know, you're measuring, and it's an absolute thing, and a uh, you know, measurement error. And, uh, yeah, I, I know what you're right. You are, you're definitely right, but to avoid what you're saying is right. you set a goal. Right. And like, right. like remember that we had that case. We said if the, if the MRI gets worse, I'm opening up this abscess. And then, like, bump, that's it. I'm doing it. And I don't. I resist that. That the difference feeling. is that got worse. The difference is at three months, four months, they have no pain. And they're feeling good. And he said, now you want to operate on me, Doc? And you're saying, well, it looks like, so, so that, that's a little bit of a I did. He said, I feel fine. I was like, no, we're doing it. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. I saw him yesterday, actually. Obviously, you meant for a without worrying about your time Not at all. You have good solid bone. Uh, I think we had good, once you've closed up the facet, you have good posterior stability. Uh, I thought I think there was no reason. There's I think when you have an unstable burst fracture and you're distracting the segment where you have your your instrumentation is now load bearing versus load sharing, that's when you get into trouble. That's when you fracture your screws. This is a load bearing situation. The middle column was essentially intact, and you were you're like a seesawing back and just distract you know compressing posteriorly. So this this really is a load sharing device. Very little chance of failure with the short segment fusion. It's like a tension band. It's a posterior, tension band, right? It's a so it's a whole different band. scenario than if you if you have you not know, complete void anteriorly. Yeah, not the, complete you're, you're, you're holding that apart with your instrumentation. And, and remember, there's a body of evidence to suggest that you could go and do this without any bone grafting, right? Yeah, let the bone heal. Yeah. Let the bone heal, and then go back and take take it all out. And if if this patient ends up with a non-union, then the upper level for whatever reason, that's no big deal. This that fracture is gonna heal. That vertebral body will heal. There's no disc interposed in that. It's got a, a huge surface area, it's cancellous bone. So that's that's really not gonna be an issue. And that would heal not operably too. The question is the is the size of the pain balance over the long course. So I think this is a perfect case for a short segment. The other piece is there's no comminution there. Even if you have bone surface, there's no comminution. Um, so, to Paul's point, it's load sharing, and you don't have to do a decompression. So, if you have to do a wide decompression for whatever reason, remember your th thoracic spine, the transverse processes are not like a lumbar spine where you can place bone graft out there. 
there's almost no surface area for bone graft in the thoracic spine. Um, so leaving the intact lamina, you have dramatic space for bone graft. Um, so that's another factor. If you have to do an osteotomy or decompression at these levels, then I would say you may need to go up and down a little bit further. Relative indication for that. Yeah, back to normal activity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great job. All right, thanks. Thank you. So that, that last x-ray really will serve as a baseline on x-ray because you yeah. really start want to see the person in or yeah. the Yeah, yeah. Good. You know, a lot of good shit in the residence. Uh, oh, oh, a lot of good sure. shit. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was going to do a week. Nice.